Welcome to the Advocacy Exchange. I am Dave Craig, two-time cancer care survivor, caregiver, and the CEO of Grit Health. We are deeply honored to bring this 43rd live episode of the Advocacy Exchange to you in partnership with Bristol Myers Squibb, the founding partner of this platform. In each of these sessions, we try to really go behind and dig into the topics that aren't talked about openly or enough when it comes to living with a diagnosis. And we work to bring together voices from around the world to share their perspectives and to share their work that they're doing to improve outcomes for people living with a diagnosis. Today, I am truly humbled to say that we have individuals sharing their story and their perspectives across North America, Europe, and Asia to really give us an understanding of what it's like to live with and navigate different diseases in different parts of the world. And to start us off, it is a true honor for me to introduce the human who will give us the welcoming remarks. Trisha Yap is the Vice President of Worldwide Commercial Dermatology and Rheumatology for Bristol Myers Squibb. And Trisha, in our prep conversations together, it really struck me when we think about my disease does not define me and dealing with stigma, our focus today, how much you really try to think about the human experience and the journey going through this diagnosis. And so it's for your professional expertise and your focus on humanity that we are honored to welcome you. Thank you so much, Dave. I hope you can hear me. And welcome everybody to this session of the Advocacy Exchange. Uh, it's truly a privilege to be part of this important dialogue today. Uh, as Dave said, psoriasis is a widely prevalent chronic systemic immune mediated disease. And this substantially impairs patients' physical health, their quality of life, as well as their work productivity. It's a serious global pr uh, problem impacting at least 100 million patients worldwide, including 14 million people in Europe and approximately seven and a half million people in the United States. And as you know, people with chronic illnesses often manage multiple layers of their condition. In addition to an array of physical symptoms and side effects, people with psoriasis also report an impact on their emotional well-being. They're uh, straining both personal as well as professional relationships and causing a reduced quality of life. Psoriasis is also associated with multiple comorbidities that may impact patients' well-being, including psoriatic arthritis, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, and depression. By understanding the diverse lived experiences of others and talking openly about what obstacles and challenges people face, we bridge the gap between patient obstacles and solutions as these discussions inform their research as well as care teams that have a direct impact on medicine development and patient outcomes. I am so excited to kick off this engaging conversation with all of you today, which focuses on managing mental health while facing a chronic illness like psoriasis. We'll hear from Ingvar, from Yusel, as well as Hannah, who will speak openly about disease-related stigma and the impact it's had on their daily lives. They'll talk about themes including isolation, cultural and societal standards, and workplace stigma, and how they manage mental health while living with a chronic illness. It is these honest conversations that keep moving healthcare forward, and why we're grateful to have the Advocacy Exchange platform in place for this purpose, for patient communities to share, learn, and collaborate. As always, Everything we do at BMS is centered on patients and considers patients as the experts in their disease. We are committed to elevating patient care to new standards to deliver what matters most, the promise of living a better life. Additionally, I also want to give special recognition to the psoriasis community, especially as we uh, celebrate the upcoming World Psoriasis Day on October 29th. I'm honored to welcome you all here today and look forward to hearing more about your experiences. I also want to thank each of you for the work you do on behalf of all individuals living with chronic disease and your ongoing partnership with BMS. Dave, back to you. 
Thank you so much, Tricia. It's been such an honor to prepare for this session with you and so glad you started this off that way. Thank you. Um, Tricia also mentioned uh, the focus on psoriasis uh, today in today's conversation. And so I also wanna take a moment as we start here to mention that August was National Psoriasis Awareness Month and we are fast approaching uh, World Psoriasis Day next month, which has been celebrated on October 29th for more than a decade. Okay, uh, we have our three speakers who are gonna share their lived experience with us. And the way we really try to dig into these conversations is to start with the personal story, what it's like to live this diagnosis and how it affects us as humans. And so to start that conversation, I am honored to welcome Yusel Martinez, advocate and employee at Bristol Myers Squibb. Thank you, Yusel. Good, Good morning, David. Thank you. Okay, so just to share a little bit about my personal story, I was diagnosed with MS at the age of 23. Uh, it, I didn't really know much about MS at the time. I started to have some strange symptoms, and at 23, I figured. I'll go to the only doctor a 23-year-old really visits. It's uh, her OBGYN. And I shared with him that I was having some um, numbness in my hands and in my abdomen. And I really wasn't sure what to make of it. Um, the symptoms would come and go as the day progressed. In the mornings when I worked out, they were more intensified. And uh, later in the afternoon, they seemed to subside. And it really wasn't um, something that I can pinpoint specifically when or how I was feeling them. But I knew that throughout the day, they would intensify and lessen. And so he was astute enough to recommend me to the neurologist, at which point I went, made my appointment, and uh, they scheduled me for an MRI went for my MRI and then called me back almost immediately and said, you need to come to the office tomorrow and you need to bring a family member. So immediately I thought, okay, I'm dying. I've got some tumor that they're gonna diagnose me with. And so panic uh, went, uh, went into mind and I uh, scheduled my appointment for the next day, went in and he shared with me that I had something called multiple sclerosis. I had no idea what multiple sclerosis was as many people that I've spoken to throughout the years um, don't have a deep understanding of MS, they confuse it with muscular dystrophy. Uh, they're not really certain of what to expect when I mention that I have MS. Most reactions are, what do you mean you have MS? You don't look like you have MS. I'm not certain what someone that looks like they have MS is supposed to look like, but um, that was my experience and uh, at that time, there weren't too many options for medications. Uh, I was very limited to what I could take. Um, it was very frustrating. Initially, I went through what most patients go through, which, which is shock, then you know frustration, denial, anger, and, and all the way through till I finally was able to accept that this was something that I was gonna be dealing with for the rest of my life. And I decided this is not going to define who I am. I'm going to, I'm not MS. I'm going to manage this uh, illness. And that's how I've lived my life from that point moving forward. Yeah. Um, I think I shared, you sell in our prep conversations, my best friend was diagnosed with MS the same year I had a cancer diagnosis. And so I've seen his journey and the way you share yours is just so empowering. I'm so excited for everybody here to get to hear more as we move forward. And uh, also just want to point out as we welcome our next two speakers, uh, Neelam is saying hello to both Ingvar and Hannah in the chat. Uh, we would love everybody to use the chat. Let us know where you're connecting from. Please say hi to our speakers and drop in any comments or questions as we go through the session. We'll do our best to kind of play off of those in the chat as well as we speak. Okay, wonderful. Uh, moving on to our second uh, speaker for today, uh, Ingvar Ingers Ingberson is the vice president of the board of IFPA. And Ingvar, um, as a man, um, hearing the way you speak about your experiences and learn to be open you know, with others around you, it gives me strength to try to do that. And so just so humbled to welcome you and hear your story. Thank you, David. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and I feel so honored to be asked to participate in this panel. 
Um, I was diagnosed diagnosed with psoriasis at the age of 23. Started as a fairly mild, like skin plaques uh, on my uh, well lower body. Uh, was very mild for several years. Then I found out that one of my worst triggers for my disease is stress. Uh, when I was finishing my bachelor's degree, uh, got worse. Um, been uh, trying out all different kinds of medication. Um, in psoriasis, you have to go through kind of a step ladder, trying with different um, treatment options before you can go to the what we call the best ones yet. <laughs> so you have to kind of, I, I don't want to say suffer, but um, you kind of have to try out several things before you can get to the best available options today. Um, I have been on um, Biologic for some years now. Uh, I'm 99% clear. I say clear. Not healed or cured because there's no cure for psoriasis yet. We, we are very optimistic. Um, yeah, I was diagnosed at 23. I'm 53 years old now. Uh, been traveling with this or taking this journey for well over 30 years and gotten something of a really big backpack for my journey. Um, as you said, I'm a board member of IFPA, the International Federation of Psoriasis Associations, and it's just been a part of my journey to advocate and help with the patient community. Thank you so much, Ingvar. I know in our conversations, we said that nothing is off limits. And so I look forward to digging into some really good topics, important topics together. <laughs> Thank you. And please, everybody help me welcome our third uh, speaker today, Hannah Zarzoso. Um, Hannah, not only the way you navigate in the part of the world that you're located, but also in the industry that you work in, just hearing your story, is so powerful and empowering to me. Um, Hannah is the president of Sorfil and Miss Universe Philippines finalist. And Hannah, we are so honored to welcome you. Thank you. Nice to meet all of you. And I'm so honored to be here. Um, I would just like to correct, I am the president of Psoriasis Philippines Youth. So we have Psoriasis Philippines and it is a branch of uh, Psoriasis Philippines, which is more focused on the youth. Anyways, going to my personal story, I am Hannah Rizorzoso, and I was diagnosed with psoriasis at 19. I am currently turning 25, so I am almost going to live with a psoriatic disease for six years. So initially, I had psoriasis on my scalp, but I didn't know that it was psoriasis. I thought that I was just stressed out because of my bachelor's degree. I was in my second to the last year of finishing it. I was running for magna cum laude, Latin honors. So I was really focused on studying. I was just grinding every day. And um, it got really worse. It went to my hairline and then... Um, symptoms uh, or like plaques showed he on this part of my arm and so I thought it was just allergies because that time I was eating a lot of chicken because as a student living in a city you you just get chicken <laughs> so I told my mom I'm gonna go to the dermatologist which is just near our school and get it checked so that I drink the meds and it would be cured but then when I went to the dermatologist, she asked me if I have it on my head, if I have it on my other parts of the body. And so later on, she then diagnosed me with the psoriatic disease. And then at first, I had, I, I, it was so foreign to me. I didn't know what it was. Um, the only recall that I had during that conversation with my dermatologist was that she said the word currently incurable. So 
for me as a college student, having to hear that was very devastating because I know nothing about this disease. And yet you tell me that there's no cure. Like, what is this? And so um, at first it wasn't worse. I had like topicals on and yeah, it was okay for a few months but then it started getting worse I was so stressed on why it was it, it was erupting <laughs> I was flaring up and people around me had no idea what it was psoriasis was very foreign none of my families know it none of my friends know it so I had to figure it out all on my own I had no one. I felt so alone. I felt so isolated, especially because I felt very different than who I was prior to psoriasis. So since I was only diagnosed at 19, I actually had a normal life. And having to have to not experience that normal life right now, or since I had the disease, it was kind of difficult to accept because I was very used to having a fast-paced life, multitasking, doing things with this and that. And then having to have this disease tell you to stop, to tell you to change your lifestyle, to navigate your dreams, to navigate almost everything in your life is just very frustrating. So there was a time in my life that because I felt so alone, I struggled mentally, physically, emotionally, I I flunked my exams. I had to move to another school, which was supposed to be my last year. And it was very difficult for me because I was figuring out a disease that I didn't know. And now I have to adapt to another community another environment so um in that time i was close to just wanting to drop out i wanted to stop school i i skipped class but my parents didn't know anything about this i kept everything from them because i didn't want them to feel what i was feeling i didn't want to be a burden to them cuz all my life I was this straight A student. I was this eldest daughter who just wants to make their parents proud. And yet me having this disease tells so much or gives the opposite. I did not want to be a burden. And so that really affected my relationship with my family as well. I became very cranky whenever they asked me because they wanted to help me. Um, they asked me like, when is this going away? But I can't even answer them because I really don't know when this is going to go away. And so um, there was a time that I had this huge argument with my father. I would never forget it because it was on New Year's Day. And I just kind of blew up uh, in front of my whole family because here in the Philippines, we gather as a family during our New, Year New Year's Day celebration and everybody was just there. I was sobbing. I was letting all those emotions just flow and just out until everybody in the family was also sobbing because all these time, um, they were really seeing how much I was struggling, but I did just not open it to them. And that hurt them the most too they wanted to help me but they didn't know how to because I didn't open up to them and so since I had uh, this communication with my family it really went lighter or right? it became lighter for me um, sharing my pain and my struggles with them uh, brought so much ease in my life uh, to the point that I started also sharing my own story, reaching out towards other people or other psoriasis warriors online. And little did I know that while I was also sharing my story on my social media platforms, I was starting to heal. And until I started pursuing pageantry again, I joined my local pageant uh, with a psoriasis flare-up. The organizers told me to postpone my 
my candidacy in the pageant until my my skin was clear my my skin was already clear but then I was super stubborn and told them that no I wanted to show up as myself because I want to show other girls and show other people that no matter the obstacles and the limitations that life gives you you are allowed and you do permit yourself to pursue your dreams and so with that I was I was blessed enough to be given the crown and I had to, the chance to represent my city into other national pageants and then come this year, which is Miss Universe Philippines. Um, I landed in our top 10 here as a finalist and that is a really huge achievement for me because Miss Universe Philippines is a really big platform here and having able to share my advocacy, having been able to share my story in a platform where a lot of young girls watch, a lot of young girls really dream of becoming one and just seeing someone like me who is flawed, who has imperfections, just stand up there and be proud of herself is really something I am proud of. And also, since the focus is really on Miss Universe during pageant season, I was able to utilize this platform to spread more awareness about the psoriatic disease and even utilize it to also go to Congress and support um, in the filing of our psoriasis bill here in the Philippines. And so I'm glad that right now, whenever I say, oh, I have psoriasis back in my hometown or just to maybe here in our community, people say, oh yeah, psoriasis, I already know that. So from before or from five years ago, when, pe when you say people, I have psoriasis, when you tell people that I have psoriasis, they, they said, what's that? We don't know that. So you see the progress over the years and it really just starts with sharing your story, getting that awareness out there because once we start talking about it, a lot of people collectively want to talk about it and we be heard. And then that's when changes come in. That's when policy making starts. That's when our our departments or our government is going to hear us. And so I bet that we will not stop talking and sharing and raising awareness until we get our desired results. That's amazing. Hannah, you touched on something that was just such an important part of all the conversations. Yastel, if we can go to you, because I know you talked about this too, you know, when it comes to the stigma and the things that Hannah experienced, I know that you shared, you know, stigma is about looking sick but it can also be about you don't look sick enough or are you really sick because we can't see it outside. So you saw, what has that been like for you and how have you dealt with that in your life? So that is one of the most interesting parts of these immunologic diseases, right? The illnesses that many, many times people cannot see what your body is going through, what you're feeling. Um, the, um, like you said, Hannah, the, the plaques, with MS, people can't see the fatigue. They can't see the numbness that you're feeling in your arms and your legs and um, just the exhaustion. I remember uh, there was a time when I, like I was sharing with you that when uh, I, I was ex trying to explain to my husband how tired and fatigued I was. And, you know, it's almost like, yeah, yeah, you know, you just need to rest. And it's not just, yeah, go sit on the couch for a little while or go take a nap. It's like you wake up in the morning and 10 minutes into your day, you feel like you've ran a marathon. And that's really hard for people to understand when you get up in the morning, you have your routine, you go on about your day and you just have to plow through your daily tasks without really being able to sit back and take the the rest that your body truly needs. And so it was a time when I was going through uh, medication changes and I said to him, come with me to the doctor. I really want you to sit in and listen to what are my next options. And I remember we were sitting in the waiting room and I ran into one of the reps in neurology that I had known for many years. And so we started chatting and uh, she says to my husband, you know, when she tells you that she's tired or fatigued, she really means she feels like she ran a marathon a couple times throughout the day. And I think that for the first time, he started to listen to 
some of the responses, not only from someone else, but from my doctor as well, talking about some of the symptoms, seeing the doctor tell me to walk along the hallway just to observe my gait. And so when I'm walking around going to work in heels, right, people don't think that's a someone with MS. They expect to see you with a cane or a walker or, you know, just looking different or in a wheelchair. People don't expect to see someone that's walking around in heels, going about their day, like as normal, so to speak, as possible. So it's really like a silent illness, right? You just struggle with those symptoms. And many days, like the numbness, for example, in my left hand never really goes away. And it's just something that I've learned to deal with, right? So you have coping mechanisms. I try to work out as often as possible. I try to keep myself healthy, to eat as healthy as possible. Um, I have four children. I have two boys that have special needs that there is no downtime for, for my family, for myself and my husband. We really just have to keep going. So life just pushes you along and you just kind of make lemonade, right? With those lemons that you've been dealt. And, and then that's part of this disease and this illness that most people expect you to look or carry yourself a certain way, right? Based on their interpretation of what an MS patient should look like or a psoriatic patient should look like or a lupus patient or any of these um, immune uh, compromising illnesses. And it's not a one size fits all. Many of us, you know, really just struggle just to keep it together. And uh, it's a daily, it's a daily struggle. Yes, I have someone in my life that has lupus and I know that, you know, a lot of times she has to just move her hands to deal with the pain. What do you want the world to know about what that feels like when, you know, you're trying to do something for your family or do something at work and you just have that pain in your hands? What is that like for you? So the other thing is that many of these uh, autoimmune diseases don't come in singles, right? right? They come in pairs, they come in multiples. So along with the MS throughout the years, now I've developed arthritis. So I have joint pains all the time. So you kind of know your triggers, right? You learn that um, sugars, uh, alcohol, different triggers, stress cause these flare-ups. And so you learn to manage them as best as possible. Uh, and I don't, you know, for me, I think that one of the things that you learn to do is, like I said, just plow through. And I don't, I never complain about it. I never use my MS as a crutch. I never say I can't do that because I'm tired or because I have MS. I live my life as if I don't have MS. I only remember that I have MS when I'm talking about it. And I try really to share that message with as many people as possible, like Hannah was saying. Throughout my uh, the course of 27 years, I've encountered so many people in offices, uh, my hairdresser's son, my hairdresser's nephew. Uh, people have asked me, oh, you have MS? I have a sister that just got diagnosed. Do you mind talking to her? I've spoken to so many people that I've never even met in person that I've just given them my phone number. And I said, absolutely, have them call me. And I've walked them through my disease, my illness, the years, the medications, what I went through, uh, what can they expect? And, and just giving them that um, little glimmer of hope, right? And I feel like if I can be that, that light, that beacon of hope for someone that was just recently diagnosed, then I served a purpose, right? It wasn't just I had MS, but I've been able to serve a purpose to help others along their illness. And I think that that's important to give back. I think it's important for those of us um, who are able to speak and who are able to explain to others what they can expect and 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 give it and give them that message with a sense of empathy and a sense of hope is so important, right? I share that with my son all the time, who's in a wheelchair. I'm like, be an advocate for those other children who have. Uh, an illness that can't be a, a voice for themselves, that can't speak for themselves. And I think that that's so important in our platforms and in what we do every day. For me, I'm in offices all the time. I work with providers all the time and we talk about illnesses and it's so important for providers not to be jaded, to know that behind that illness, there's a human and there's families and there are other people that are 
involved and are touched by our illnesses and our diseases, right? And how does that affect those people? How can we empower them to learn about our illnesses and learn how they can continue to carry that message forward and help others? So. Yeah, um, I love Neil. I'm just put in the chat behind the illness. There is a human and the way we each embody what we hope for the world is how others learn. I'm so grateful others have you each as that example to learn from. And Ingvar, she touched on something that I know we talked about quite a bit in our conversations. I know you've had a personal experience, you know, in the work environment. And back when we were just coming up with the idea for this session, that was something that Neelam at BMS really wanted to bring attention to, you know, that, you know, in our family lives, sometimes we can talk or be more open but people in our work lives or our, you know social lives around us don't know all these things we go through. And I know you've had a, a really powerful example of that that you shared in our prep session. And please, anything you have to say on this topic. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for bringing that up. Um, as we talk, I, I connect with so many things that Yisha said, especially about the boundaries. Uh, it's It's so often that we ourselves set our boundaries just to be comfortable we have to break out of break the, break out of the box and you know just be open and like hannah said we have to be open we have to be able to talk about it we have to make ourselves vulnerable in order for us to you know i, I don't like the word to get better but in order to get like more comfortable with ourselves, not to accept it, but be, be, be able to do something about it. And uh, that thing that you mentioned is that it was kind of my moment that I realized that, okay, I can do something. I can, I don't know, take a small step of making the world maybe a slightly better place by starting with my workplace. Um, at that time, I was really bad with psoriasis. I had been in and out of the hospitals, and I, I had psoriasis on my palms. So I was really in pain. It itched a lot, and when you mean itching, take your common itching, you know, of the scalp and multiply it by hundred. You itch until it bleed. And that makes you feel good because it itches so much. So I was wearing white cotton gloves and I used to tape them around me because so I wouldn't take off my gloves and be able to scratch myself. And at the time I was uh, doing a really stressful job. So I was really bad. I was walking around the cafeteria. Can't remember if I was at the coffee machine or the water machine, getting a cup of something to drink. And this guy, he was just watching me and say, oh, Mickey Mouse, you know, because of, I was wearing, I think I was wearing a black sweater or blue sweater uh, with psoriasis all around my sweater. So, you know, I, you literally could see the path behind me. And I was wearing gloves and he said, oh, Mickey Mouse. And I kind of felt embarrassed about it. Uh, took my water and started to walk back to my workstation. But uh, then I thought, no, I'm not going to accept it. So I turned around, uh, took my white cotton gloves off, showed my hands to him and said, I have psoriasis. Do you want to ask me something? And that was kind of a moment for him, that poor guy, um, trying to make a comment, trying to be funny, but all he wanted was to ask me a question. And he said, yeah, um, it was like my father or my grandfather has psoriasis, so I'm, I was just curious. But it broke out like that. He wanted to be funny. He, he just needed something to get my attention. And then I started talking to him about psoriasis, the little I didn't know at that time. But it kind of got me started. Okay, there's something more here you know, there's something more we could do. And that kind of was my moment. Like, okay, maybe there's something I can do even though I'm really bad and feel miserable. Uh, I'm complaining, uh, you know, 
just being sick. <laughs> but at that time, uh, also, uh, I came in contact with the local uh, psoriasis organization here in Iceland. And that was also a life-changing moment for me to, you know, get to know people that, you know, were in the same situation as I was, even though I felt that they had it so much worse than I had. And to be able to get that support of that community to reach out, you know, to ask for help because I was about to give up. So you could call it that, you know, we have to also be able to reach out, ask for help. We can't do it alone. We're a community and we're a really big community. Ingvar, I have to ask in that moment, I know for me personally, you know, I've gone through two reproductive cancers. And when people, you know, joke or make comments about, you know, being a man or those kinds of things, it like really cuts at the things that I have the most shame about, you know, and it's so hard to quiet myself in those moments and use it like you did as a way to educate and a way to connect. How did you do that in the moment? How did you, you know, um, handle how you were feeling inside and be able to connect with somebody in a way to help them understand like you did? Um, I, I, I think I had to use every strength that I had. I had to turn up my empathy to like 15, if normal was like 10. Um, but th there are moments you, you just can't explain it. You just, something just happens. Something triggers, something, you know, you've had enough or, you know, you, you step up. We're humans, we do the unexpected things, and we kind of step up at the right moment. I hope anyone with each of your comments that finds themselves in those moments of, you know, feeling shame or stigmatized can feel that empowerment to make those connections. And I know, Hannah, if we can go to you, you shared something very similar in our conversations you know, this diagnosis isn't just about the person dealing with it or even the caregivers. It's about the family and the work and society around us, you know, and, and you shared, I'll never forget the way you said it. It's that but moment. You know, it's wonderful you're doing things, but should you really push yourself that hard or should you really be doing that much? How do you deal with those moments, Hannah, where, you know, people might be trying to support you, but, you know, how you handle the way it makes you feel about living with your diagnosis? Uh, it's really difficult, although, yeah, I had a lot of butt moments um, before having this psoriatic disease. I've always dreamt of becoming a beauty queen and joining Miss Universe. And my parents know that and they're very supportive of that. And they were. <laughs> and um, during the time that when I told my family that, hey, mom, dad, I want to pursue it now. I want to do this. Are you in? And they said, yeah, we're in. And so along the way during the pageant, uh, they saw me that I was really having a hard time. My body was catching up on me because our schedules were like every day I only get at least three hours of sleep. And you know what stress does to psoriasis. Um, we flare up. And then I had this moment with my mom and my parents when they told me that, are you sure you can still push it? I said, yeah, yeah, I still can. And I will push it regardless of whatever it is, because I cannot let psoriasis define me and stop me from achieving my dreams. And during the pageant, a lot of people have already been seeing my potential. Oh, she's beautiful. She can talk well. She's this and she's that. But I always get these comments that I always get comments like, oh, she's this and that, but she has psoriasis. If she wins, can she handle the responsibility? We feel like this disease will limit her from doing more and more and more. And so when I receive comments like these, I, I can't deny the fact that I also think about it. But whenever I think of the moment 
in my room when I was just being almost close to depressed, being super anxious. And then here comes me reading comments and stories about um, healing on other psoriasis warriors. It also reminds me that I really want to give back to our community, just like what Yisal said earlier was so beautiful that we owe it to give back to our community because they helped us in becoming who we are now. And so uh, with that, I am currently in the aviation industry and as I, I am studying to become a flight attendant and you know how flight, uh, well, at least here in the Philippines, we have very high standards. You need to be flawless. You need to be that. You need to be this and that. But yet here I am a person with the psoriatic disease still pushing for my dreams, still pushing for things that people might find it impossible for me to do. So because of this community, because of you guys, I am very much inspired to still push and prove everybody wrong that when that to prove to everybody that despite having this, we can still do it. We can still push and go for our dreams. And although we might not we might not be using the usual route as what normal people do we can still get there so if normal people can do it in one day we just need to make an extra effort we do it three days behind so we get there together um, we get there in the same day that they can get there so i really want to encourage others also to to keep going and just have hope. Our normal should be known as normal to other people because I have psoriasis, I've been living with this. This is my reality and people deserve to know that. Also with the ESL, also with Ingvar, they deserve to know our realities and we deserve to put it out there and normalize it. Yeah. Um, Hannah, you can do it, and we can't wait to cheer you on as you do. No but, and we can't wait to cheer you on. I, I hope you get to see in the chat, too, everybody's comments that they're sharing when you have a minute to peek at those. It's so wonderful to see all the comments everybody's uh, writing as you're each talking. Um, Yassel, I wanted to jump to you on that point. Um, I know that for me, uh, Richard Standiford at BMS, uh, who connected us and started this relationship, has been a place for me to talk about things that I didn't know how to find my voice and to be open and welcoming. And I know you've shared, you know, how you're learning to find your voice in a way that empowers others. How do you find those spaces and those relationships to be able to be a voice? So those spaces are not always there. Those spaces are often created, right? And I try and take every opportunity that I can to talk about, you know, myself, what my experiences have been, and, and my children, right? And so when I have conversations with people and we're just having small talk and, you know, you're starting to talk about your lives, your kids, you know, I don't want to always just talk about, you know, the children and what's happening in their lives because I know parents tend to want to uh, gloat and boast about their children. But oftentimes we'll get into different conversations and I try and find that opportunity to share with others the fact that I have MS and again I try to use it as a platform of not like feel sorry for me oh my god I, you know woe is me I have MS I don't use it in that in that manner but I use it as a as a way to just create that awareness and I say oh and by the way yes I do all of these things and I have MS and I always put my name in the hat for everything anyone that works with me can tell you that every time that there's an opportunity, I'm like, oh, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of this committee. I want to, I want, you know, I want to join in, put me in, who can I talk to? So I always try to um, integrate myself into as many things as possible. And in talking to others, I somehow find a way to share my story. And I find that that's been very empowering, not only for myself, but it's been enlightening to find that there's so many other people like I said, that have family members, that have friends, that have best friends, like you, Dan, that have been diagnosed with MS. And, and we start to talk about what those experiences have been like and um, what it's what they're going through, what 
um, what, what, are, what are their challenges, how I can help. I too have a platform uh, that I share my stories uh, online and I have a team and it's called Blessed. And I don't go in there as often as I'd like just because of time constraints. But when I do, I always try to put positive uh, feedback to other people's stories. And I love to read what people are going through because I always do take the time to write a little message and say, you can do it. Today is going to be a beautiful day. Get out there. You're alive. You're, you know, you're, you're as healthy as you can be. And that's different for everyone. And, you know, Hannah, you used a great word, which was flawless. You need to be flawless. And you know what, does, it, does that really exist? Flawless? You know, I think that we're all flawless in our own way right and one of the things that I like to use one of the terms that I like to use in my family is we're perfectly imperfect and and that's the reality all of us are perfectly imperfect none of us are perfect we all have our own imperfections we all have our own challenges and that's different for everyone and some you can see and some you can't but it doesn't mean that they're not there right so I try to take every opportunity that I can to share my story, to share what MS has been like for me, to share my challenges, to share my triumphs, um, and just to share the, the, the news and the information that even though you can't see some of our illnesses, it doesn't mean that they're not real. And just to create that empathy for others. Um, Ingvar, you know, I think that Mickey Mouse story for me was very touching. And I think you have handled it just beautifully by saying, you know, taking off your gloves and saying, here you go, you know, is there something you want to talk about? And I think that when I share my story and I open up about my MS to others, it's like the equivalent of you're taking off the gloves, right? It's taking off that, that mask that we all put forward in our day-to-day -day lives. And we try to pretend like everything's all together. We've got it all together. We're moving forward. Put me in, put me in, put me in all these activities and all these uh, committees. And I think that we all tend to do that. We wear these masks to just try to plow, plow through our day to day, right? But sometimes we just got to step back, take off those masks and say, this is our reality. Let's talk about it. So I don't know if you got to see Lucas's comment in the chat. There's a wonderful comment in the chat for you. That's my son. <laughs> <laughs> He's my uh -huh. son in the wheelchair. He's the one that I'm always talking about. Go out and share the world, share your news and share your story with others and with the world. So uh. that's, rem that's remarkable. I know, um, Hannah, just as the last topic, you know, we always think about sharing our personal stories, finding our voices, the start point, and then other people learn from us. They learn how to find their voices and then ultimately to change systems and change society. So what would you recommend? Do you have books or things that inspire you that anybody here can learn from or what resources have helped you? Uh, for ESL, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so when I was diagnosed, the doctor gave me a book that was kind of like a uh, MS for new, new, newly diagnosed patients. And it was very, very helpful uh, to, to read the book. It was kind of like a very simple to follow along what to expect question, you know, Q and a book. And the other thing that really, the book is probably obsolete by now. That was 30 years ago. Right. I don't, I did share a book, uh, with, um, uh, with you on our, on our uh, page. I think it's going to be posted afterwards. I didn't bring the book with me cause I'm traveling for work. Uh, but definitely it's, it's a newly diagnosed, uh, book. If you can share it on our, on the chat, that would be great. Um, and I think if you can find that, I found it, I found this new version on Amazon and really what it does, it just answers a lot of these questions that many patients have. Like, for example, with MS, one of the, one of my concerns was, uh, what, what is, is this going to be? How is this going to transfer over to my children? At the time I didn't have children. I wasn't married. And so I had all those questions like, is this something that I'm going to pass along to my family? Uh, what can I expect during pregnancy? You know, there's a lot of unknown, right? When you're diagnosed with, with one of these chronic illnesses, it's a, there's a lot, a lot of questions and, and just you're so confused at the time, right? When you're first diagnosed, like, am I going to end up 
you know, a burden to others and when's the right time to share with employers and when is the right time to share my story? And I think that that's something that I still struggle with, right? So that question um, is something that comes up on resumes and, and, and uh, not re resumes, but applications all the time, right? They ask you, are you disabled? And that's one of the, one of the points is MS. That's one of the, one of the criterias. And no, I don't see myself as disabled. I'm not disabled. I'm perfectly abled. I work. I, you know, I run a, a household. I, I'm not disabled. So whether it's my mistake or not, I always put that I am not disabled because I am not disabled. I think that that is something that they should probably take off of these op job applications, right? Because mm -hmm. when people see it, they automatically assume what is disabled. It's different for everyone. And so, so disabled is unable to carry out the task right before you, the job that you're expected to do. Clearly, I'm not unable <laughs> to carry out my task, right, as a, as a BMS employee. So no, I am not disabled. Um, and I think that that's, you know, those are, those are just things that are so important. So that book, back to your question, um, helped me. Another thing that helped me was my doctor put me in contact with someone that was at my of my age group at the time, and she had small children, and she had been diagnosed a few years earlier, and I was able to ask a lot of those questions, like, how was it? How was pregnancy? What do you expect? So it's important not only to find um, a, an outlet. Nowadays, most people don't even read books. They just go on social media. So if you find a platform that works for you, somewhere that you can connect, somewhere that is not, it's not going to bring you down, but mostly empower you, I think that's so important. And then if you can just find other people that you can connect with and ask questions. And so I think that that's why I'm so open about my illness and I'm so ready and willing to talk about it because I feel that I can be a resource for others and a positive source of information for others. Yeah, beautiful, Yassel. Um, The book is, the link is in the chat for everybody, uh, Multiple Sclerosis, Questions and Answers for Patients and Loved Ones. And so that book is in the chat. And then all these resources live on the Advocacy Exchange platform. So thank you so much, Yassel, for sharing that. Um, also, Andrea in the chat fully agrees with you. So I hope you got to peek at Andrea's comment in the chat. I think you inspired her. Um, Hannah, I know we're just down to the last five minutes or so. Um, for you, what resources inspire you or what? I know your organization has some things. What do you want people to make sure they know about? So aside from really just searching people who have psoriasis online, we have Rocky, we have Chi Chi from all other parts of the world as well, who are my friends from um, IFPA. Uh, I would also want to... Uh, tell everybody that we have a Facebook page, which is Psoriasis Philippines. You can just show that and it will pop up. It has a number of followers and we really focus on Filipinos who are living with the disease. There we can, uh, we do accommodate your questions. We can connect you with doctors. We have great programs back here in the Philippines. And for those who may not be living in the Philippines, you can also visit our website and maybe you can also get some ideas on what we are doing here in the Philippines to strengthen our community. That's uh, wonderful, Hannah. Thank you so much. And Ingvar, to jump to you, um, what are the things that have helped you or resources that have inspired you? I know IFPA is such a global presence. What are the things you want to make sure people know about? Wow, there are many. Um, I, I've been so fortunate that my journey over the 30 years have taken me from my own safe space, which you know we create in order to, for us to you know feel better, to work for the national organization and then work for a global organization with so many resources available uh, for everybody to. Uh, to use and work with, um, to work, the work we do for IFPA is more on the global level. We work with both the UN, the WHO. Um, nine years ago, we managed to get a resolution on psoriasis. In 2016, we got a report on psoriasis, global report. We have so many resources available, both at IFPA and all the local organization, national organization. Um, 
for example, um, I know some years ago, Finland started some kind, some kind of checklist. It was credit card size, it could fit in your wallet, and it was a checklist with questions you should ask your dermatologist in your appointment. So, or not to not for, forget. I, I know that many national organizations copied that from Finland. It's just all those little tiny things that we could use and help each other work with. So it's, there's a wealth of resources out there. Uh, I know that um, all the researchers who are out there, you know, devoting their life in making us feel better and helping us and try to find the cure, they're also a resource that we have to be thankful for. So it's a big community. <laughs> there is absolutely no way we can uh, summarize all of the things you have each shared and all of the things that are available to support people. But you each have said a couple of things that have really stuck with me. Ingvar, you said in the conversation today, we often set our boundaries to be comfortable. And you are an example of pushing beyond comfort to live the life you want to and to help others live that life. And it has just been such an honor to hear your story and the ways you created examples. I'll never forget the Mickey Mouse comment and how for me, I can take those moments not to feel just shame and stigma, but to use them as a, as a moment for change. And so Ingvar, thank you for everything you do. Uh, it's so wonderful to see Yosef, your colleague from IFA in the chat as well. So thank you for bringing your friends from IFA to this session. Um, and we look forward to staying in touch. Um, Hannah, um, I think about your but statement, you know, can you do it? But, you know, we're glad you're doing this, but, and we're going to turn those into and statements, you know, you can do it and we're going to celebrate you every step of the way. So thank you for turning the butts into the ands so that other people dealing with these diagnoses can feel empowered to live their life without limits. And you've given us that example. So thank you so much, Anna. And Yassel, the, the thing that you shared, I mean, so many things you all have shared have stuck with me, but what you shared is just how much sometimes those spaces don't exist. And we don't have to wait for them to appear. We can create them. And I've taken from you more courage to create more spaces. And so I know as you find your voice and as others find you because of it, Thank you for creating these spaces, all of you, so people don't feel alone and isolated. So to our speakers, Yassel, Hannah, and Ingvar, thank you so much. Tricia, thank you for welping, welcoming us with the opening remarks. I want to thank the Bristol Myers uh, advocacy team and the organization overall for bringing this platform to life and connecting all of these individuals together. Uh, for the rest of this year, together, this community is creating two resources that have never existed. One is a guide to help people that are experiencing discrimination in healthcare, and the other is a toolkit for people that want to find their voice to create change in healthcare, like you're doing. So I encourage everybody to stay close. Please visit the advocacyexchange.com platform. Platform this session and the previous 43 are there, along with 800 or more resources from all of these advocacy organizations. So with sincere and deep gratitude. Thank you to everybody who's made this to life. And I hope for anybody out there who has felt alone or isolated, we've helped shrink that a little bit for you. Thank you.